welcome everybody. You guys, welcome. I'm Dara, you see Michelle waving, that's Michelle. I know most of you already know Michelle. So we're gonna let everybody slowly join. Um, we have over uh, almost 200 people already here waiting for this wonderful talk and we love that. We love how many people are excited about learning about Mahjong and improving their strategy. Uh, um, if, if, if for some reason you're not muted, we ask you to click on the bottom left and mute yourself because um, with over, with over uh, hundreds of people, you know, it'll just be too loud to hear everybody's background noise. Um, at the end, we will definitely unmute people if they have questions, um, if we have time permitting. So um, my name is Dara. Michelle Frizzell is our guest tonight. Donna is celebrating her anniversary with her husband and her family. So um, bear with me. She's usually the gatekeeper. So bear with me as I admit everybody to our Zoom. Um, for those of you who are new, we do these um, as a thing to connect players, to connect players with each other, connect players with teachers, to share our love of the game. And our generous guests are so generous of their time and their experience. And we don't charge for these events. These are entirely free. We share them on our YouTube channel after because we just want the green game to grow. And we know that during COVID, the comments that we get back from people about how our online tournaments have been something that they've really looked forward to and given them something to get excited to see friends on FaceTime while they play has just been so rewarding. Um, we um, are recording this, we'll share it on YouTube. If right now you are seeing um, other people, um, I'm trying to see for some reason, I have it on speaker view, but for some, yeah, for some reason, I don't know why Linda Levine is, oh, is okay. the main. Okay, I think now. Oh, so no, if see, look, he did it again. Yep, yeah, no, I'm muting everybody. <laughs> so we'll just keep working it as we admit everybody. Certainly, it's supposed to be that everybody's muted as they come in, but for some reason, there is something with Zoom that it just, for some reason, doesn't do that every time. So, um, if you want to ask any questions, um, we've had some feedback. We know that it's kind of a balance. We know you want your questions asked and answered, and we know that we want our guests to be able to talk uninterrupted. So we're trying something new today. Michelle has put certain spots within her presentation that are pauses for her to say, Dara, what questions does the peanut gallery have for me today? So we are gonna keep going through and I will save all the questions that I get to the chat. Um, we don't have everybody chatting everyone because then that just gets to be a little too hectic and hard to follow. So any questions you have, feel free to chat me. And um, with that further ado, I will keep letting everybody in. Okay. Um, and then um, I will give a little introduction. So Michelle Frizzell has a passion for Mahjong. For many of you on tonight's Zoom, Michelle needs no introduction. Through the years, Michelle has become an advanced player of several styles. National Mahjong League, which a lot of you are here for tonight, Wright Patterson, Hong Kong, and Ricci. What makes Michelle unique is not only does she play all of these, but she teaches all of these as well. And her incredible YouTube channel is invaluable resource for learn to learn the game and for people to advance their strategy. If you haven't learned from Michelle, you probably have recommended her channel to someone. So throughout life, you come across people that truly enjoy sharing their knowledge. Hold on one second. Um, Karen, I'm just gonna ask you if you could mute yourself. On the bottom left, there should be a button that says mute, thank you. So let's see if I could just switch a setting here, hold on. Hold on one second. And Sabina, if you could mute yourself. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So throughout your life, you come across people that truly enjoy sharing their knowledge and experience with others. And Michelle is one of those people. She values service to the community and is committed to providing services with the underpinnings of kindness and patience to ensure satisfied players who in turn propagate the joys of the game. 
Last year, Michelle expanded to her wonderful YouTube, uh, expanded her YouTube channel to create MajCon. Her and Debbie Barnett hosted the first annual MajCon in Orlando, Florida, and I was one of the fortunate guests to be able to attend and be an exhibitor. And Don and I are thrilled to be back next year as speakers and exhibitors. It will take place in Boca Raton, Florida, and you can find information on MajCon.com. They intend to not only stay in Florida this year, but expand, Michelle could give you more information, but expand throughout the US and even, the US and even on cruise ships. Tonight, since we have a large group, please chat with us. We will get to your chat as soon as we can. We are trying to be as interactive as possible with such a large audience. Throughout the talk, Michelle will take pauses. At the end, if time permits, we will have guests unmute themselves and ask questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn over the speaker to Michelle and she's gonna share her screen and talk to us all about Mahjong. Thank you so much, Dara. And please pass on my thanks to Donna for having me on your Zoom talk. Will do. And thank you all so much for coming. I hope that this presentation will help you build your skills and gain confidence playing the game because when we play with confident people, we all have more fun. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. Right there. Okay, here we go. Well, almost. Let me swap it. There we go. I think we've got it now. Okay, so I'm going to share my personal top three strategies. And with American Mahjong or really Mahjong in general, everybody has their own preferred strategies and style of play. So there's really no right or wrong, but there is good, better, best. And I hope to share those things with you. And if you're curious about these strategies, try them out. And if they feel like they make sense to you after you've tried them, adopt them and see if it improves your game. So, the first thing that I want to share is about situational awareness. And this is a term that I've been focusing on for the last couple of years as I've been playing other versions and also trying to adopt strategies from those versions to American Mahjong. And also, I am, I, I have some experience playing poker. So I have taken some of these ideas and have tried to incorporate them into strategies for American Mahjong, one of them being situational awareness. And we, we're gonna go into one of them specifically, but the idea with situational awareness is that it can give you an advantage at the table if you practice it. So here's how it works. It's kind of a cycle. The first thing you do is you observe what's going on at the table. And we'll go into detail about what that entails. Then you have to interpret what you observe. Then you make a decision. And finally, you take some kind of action. So you have observation. Michelle, none of the slides are changing. You're still on where to find me. Oh, well, let's see here. Um, let me stop sharing again. This is very strange. Okay, so I'm gonna, let's see. Maybe go into slideshow. Well, I was in, I was in slideshow. See, I, ha I have two monitors. And so that's, I think, maybe part of um, the challenge. So, so sorry about that. Let me escape here. Um, Bill, can you try on slideshow? Can you put um, if you there's like a thing on slideshow where you might be able to change it to um, primary monitor? Let's see. I think bear with me. I think uh, I have. I'm going to stop sharing one more time. I have my presentation open, and then I'm going to go to Zoom share, and I have screen one presentation. Okay, tell me what you see. American Mahjong top three strategies, okay. the first one. Okay, good. This is what you were supposed to be seeing. <laughs> we were seeing that. You were or weren't? Do we you... were seeing it. I think somebody thought the slides were supposed to be moving along, but Do we were see... on that slide. 
Do you see American Mahjong top three strategies? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right. So we're going to start we, over. Pardon? Now, now we just went to situational awareness. Perfect. Yeah. This is what we were supposed to be seeing. So sorry about that. All right. So just to start fresh here, the idea with situ situational awareness is that it can give you an advantage at the table if you practice it. And so there's a cycle that is involved with this overall strategy. The first one is that you observe, then you interpret what you observe, and you make a decision on that interpretation, and then there's action to follow through, whether you decide to do something or even not do something. It's still a decision with an action. So situational awareness is going to be the overarching concept for the first two of my top strategies. Alexa. And TV. also with that is a strategy that on the wall in play. I like to call it strategy by wall. And I cannot take uh, credit for this. This is a strategy. Uh -oh. I think we have. Yeah, I'm trying to mute everybody. It looks like I have a line across my screen. You, you, if you want to stop sharing, what, what if you want to, if you want to stop sharing and sharing again, that happened to me last time. For some reason, people are able to draw on the screen. I don't know where that comes from. It's, it's a Zoom thing. I got muted and it also okay, back. says host disabled participant sharing. Yeah, no, now you should be able to share it again. Okay. Nope. It still says host disabled participant sharing. Oh my goodness. Okay. Try again. It said it, okay. it should be the setting should be that every, that anybody could share now. Okay. Okay. Let me see here. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. And can everyone can everyone see my my Tom yes. Sloper slide here? All right. So you're good. It's, okay. It's important to me to give credit where credit is due. I did not make up this idea about strategy by wall, and even Tom borrowed it from chess. This is a concept where oh, there there it goes again. <laughs> again, just you know, it just ignore it, and when we share it to YouTube, I will put in the right picture without a line through it. So don't worry about that. It'll be your voice, but without the line. It will? Yeah, I could I could just input that into the YouTube video. Don't worry. Okay, okay. All right, so the idea with strategy by wall, uh, this is again, introduced by Tom Sloper and I grabbed a hold of it years ago and kind of made it my own in many ways. I just wanna make sure to give a shout out to Tom Sloper because he did he has inspired many of my own strategies that I've run with. So the idea about strategy by wall is that there are, the game is played in phases. Of course, first you're going to be doing the Charleston and you can see that there's a half wall there because the tiles have been dealt and now you're doing the Charleston. That is the begin game. So there are certain strategies that apply in the begin game. Then you have the middle game, and this is the second wall. And then the final wall is the end game. And there are strategies, like I say, for each phase of the game. So we're gonna talk about some of those with this first of my top three strategies that I like to share. Uh, so, oh, here's another visual of a begin game when you break the wall. Like if you have, if you roll the dice and break the wall, you won't, may not see a full wall. So you can see here that the middle game might be partitioned into two different walls. And that's what this is showing you here. So you have to kind of visualize a full wall when you break the wall by rolling the dice. So keep that in mind. The first of the strategies that I wanna share is called tells. And this is where my poker experience comes in. And I really feel like you can gain a lot of information at the table by observation. A tell is a change in a player's behavior that can give clues to the viability of a player's hand, or maybe a little insight into what they're thinking based on what they're doing. 
An observant player can take advantage if they understand the meaning of another player's tell. So if you are playing with the same people all the time, you can kind of get to know them over time and you can pick up on their tells and know what's going on on their side of the table. If you're playing in a drop-in game or maybe in a competition game like a tournament, you may or may not have full understanding to be able to truly interpret because you don't know that person yet. So these tells typically are work really well if you know the people that you're playing with. You can gain a lot of information. And there are three types. We have verbal tells, physical tells, and tile tells. We're gonna look at a couple of examples right now. So here's an example of a tell that you might hear during the Charleston. Somebody would say, I went the wrong way. I went the wrong way. Has anyone ever heard that? Definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Here's an example of what you might hear in the middle game. I can't buy a flower. Can't buy a flower. Can't get a flower. And here's something you might hear in the end game. Where are all the jokers? So these verbal tells most times are humorous, but for those who are observant and are able to interpret what that means, you can really use that information to help you with your own hand. So for example, with I went the wrong way during the Charleston, you know that per that player has to basically start over from scratch, which means that they're going to be trailing behind the other two players and yourself. So really you have then two other contenders and that other player is going to be trailing behind because they went the wrong way. So it gives you a little bit of time to build your hand and maybe then hopefully gain an advantage over the other two players in other ways. I, with the I can't buy a flower, this can mean that flowers are either with the other two players or they're more in the wall. So if you need flowers and someone says I can't buy a flower, well, you may have an opportunity to pick a flower from the wall or come buy one through joke or exchange or something like that. So I can't buy a flower. That's a good one. And then finally, where are all the jokers? If somebody says this kind of a thing in the end game and you happen to need jokers, well, that's a plus for you because if they don't have any, that limits, that basically takes 25% of the jokers out of the, uh, out of the way for that particular player. So it l means that either the other two players or maybe the wall has those jokers. So those are the sorts of things that you can gather from verbal tells. Now we're gonna talk about physical tells. And these are things that you would see in a, in a player as they're playing the game and they may do something like hesitate when someone discards a tile. Maybe they're, they're not ready to call that tile. So that hesitation is information that you can gain just by watching. Here's another one, a flinch, which is very similar to a hesitation. A hesitation would be that maybe they're not ready on a discard to call for an exposure. And then a flinch might be a tile that, they're, that has been discarded. And again, they're not ready. So it's just another physical reaction that you can observe to identify tiles that that player needs or wants. And then we have the cringe. Usually that cringe is kind of escalated through the game and you see a lot of cringing in the third wall or fourth wall. So all those show pain that they're not able to advance their hand because they're not ready. Or maybe that tile is what they need to win and they're not quite there yet. So those physical tells can really give you great information about the progression or lack thereof in somebody's hand. And the next one we want to talk about are tile tells. These tile tells happen and typically when someone has been trained to create breaks in the wall like this, these spaces, if, if someone is new to the game or even maybe an intermediate player, they may separate their tiles 
and create spaces. Those spaces can give you information if the particular player who's doing these things is not really really thinking about what that looks like from the other side of the table. Sometimes you can determine that, okay, they've got a, a maybe a pair that they're waiting to turn into a pung or a con, or you can see the progression of their spaces come together or come apart. And you can maybe um, visualize what could be going on in their hand as far as the progression. So spaces can be helpful to some people, but they can also give away information. So if you play with your hand, with your tiles close together with no spaces, there's no interpretation of ability there at all. People won't be able to make any kind of assumptions. And here we have another example of a tile tell. This is a tilt. So when people turn their tiles, that can give you information about that player's hand or maybe the progression of their hand. So typically what happens with a tilt is when a tile is discarded, a player will turn the tile to indicate that one of their tiles has gone out. So they'll turn the tile and you could then assume that they have that tile in their hand or maybe that particular exposure is affected by the tile that was just discarded. So that is some information that you can use when somebody tilts tiles. Another one is where people place their tiles. And this comes in with when you play with people often, recurring groups, you'll know where they keep their tiles. So if, for example, they might keep their flowers on the right side of their rack and they might keep their, sorry, they might keep their jokers over on the left side of their rack. And when you watch them it, make an exposure and pull a joker from the right side of the rack or the left side of their rack, you'll know or you'll be able to kind of tell how many jokers they have when they pick a tile and put the joker on the left or the right. You'll be able to pick up on those recurring behaviors and be able to figure out how many jokers maybe you have access to on the wall, how many flowers, depending on how they do that. And as you learn by their behavior, where they put their tiles. So the key to these tile tells is with spaces, push them together. That way nobody can make any assumptions about your hand or the progression of your hand. Don't tilt your tiles. One thing you could do if you like to be able to identify a tile that maybe is out, first of all, don't respond right after a tile has been discarded. Wait a couple turns. That way they're not able to connect that to the tile that just went down. So wait an, a, a turn or two. Uh, ahead of you so that like if the player on my right discarded a tile, the next player goes, then maybe I'll turn my tile so they'll not connect it to the player on my right who had discarded what I needed. And instead of putting it on its side, just turn it upside down because they won't be able to differentiate that from the other side of the table because it'll be able to see that. So that would be one little trick that you could do there. Make sure you don't do it when that tile is being discarded though, wait a bit and then do that bit of a, a tilt for you. And then on the placement side, train yourself to arrange your tiles differently from game to game, or maybe every couple of games, organize your tiles differently. And that way you'll keep your opponents on their toes and they won't be able to make any kind of assumptions based on your recurring behavior. Keep it changed up. Like if you put your jokers on the left, Maybe the next game, put your jokers on the right or put your flowers in the middle of your hand or on the left, as opposed to where you might normally place them on the right or what have you. So just keep it changed up a little bit to keep your opponents guessing. So this is where we're going to break and just open it up for any questions that people might have. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see each other. OK, so the first thing is, um, does thank anybody you. have any questions? So first of all, thank you so much to the very helpful Mahjong community between Heath and Sam, I mean, telling me how to um, pin you and um, how to erase the annotations. So we could chat after Michelle and I'll show you how Sam just taught me how to do that. Um, one of the questions someone asked is with your knowledge of poker, do you feel like that helps you a lot with tells in Mahjong? 
Can you repeat that? You broke up a little bit. And I, I Oh, sure. With your um, view and, and your knowledge of poker, do you feel that helps you a lot with tells in Mahjong? Yes. I, that's really where I picked up that how tells can, from poker, my poker experience can be used in Mahjong. And in poker, uh, there are tells that are based on the game and play. And since we're playing a game, it can apply similarly. Now, poker is a different kind of game and there's betting that goes on. So tells are a little different in poker, but the concepts can apply. And in American Mahjong, what I have found is that people are very animated and friendly and open about and social. And these are the kinds of behavior information can slip through without people even really being aware of it in some cases. But if you're observant, as I shared in the beginning of the slide, if you're observant and you can interpret correctly these tells, you can use that information to help you make decisions on your own hand. And that would be and, watching for physical at reactions and things like that. Yep. And then a, fo a follow-up question to that, a similar question was we had, do you ever bluff like in poker by making a verbal tell that doesn't apply to your hand? Okay. I personally don't bluff, but I know people can bluff even in, in, in Mahjong, just like in poker, you can bluff. Now, bluffs typically in poker are about betting. And since we don't have that kind of betting in our game, the types of bluffs you might see here would be somebody feigning. Basically, they might say, where are all the jokers? And here they are sitting with a bunch of jokers. Of course, we're not going to know that. But by continually observing, you're going to be able to know when somebody's bluffing even because you're going to see their hand in the end and say, what do you mean? Where are all the jokers? You had jokers. I just saw you put up a hand with a bunch of jokers. So then you'll be able to use that information even to help you identify bluffing. Uh, okay. Another thing that people might do with a bluff would be, let's say that they have jokers in their hand and you're in the end game and they don't want to discard a joker because it could alert the table that someone is waiting on a pair or maybe they're waiting um, or, or they're waiting for their winning tile, whether it's a single or a pair or just a regular. Can take a joke, a, a, a natural tile from their hand and utilize that joker in its place and discard a natural tile, but yet they're still ready to win. That's another way that people can bluff. And so that can be, you, and that can be ahead. risky because someone in my game did that and that was my winning tile. Exactly. So, <laughs> so another so question we you got You want to be is, very mindful of what's been discarded and yep. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Another question oh. we got was, okay. um, how does the way people put their tiles give off information about their hand? So this comes in when you're playing with the same people. So I know, for example, a, a friend of mine would always put her jokers on the left side of her rack. So when she put out an exposure, I would see her grab for the left side of her rack for that joker and expose it. So when she's picking from the wall and she puts it on the left side of her rack, I can assume that could be a joker, especially right. if she smiles. <laughs> so well, it's funny. It's funny you say that because on our last talk that we had with um, Donna Miller Small, someone asked in the chat, "How can you read tells when you're playing online?" And we all laughed. And then the next time I played online, I'm like, you know what? You actually can because the speed of which the computer rejects a tile helps know that they don't have enough jokers or that it's not a tile they can call. And then what yeah. they're passing back to you gives tells. So it yes. kind of was funny, but you actually can get some tells from the box. Yeah. Um, so the, the next question, let's see, I'm scrolling through. Um, what did you say again was the reason that players turn their tiles sideways? Okay, there's a couple of reasons. One, the primary reason that I've observed is when someone, a player discards a tile that somebody needs but is not ready to call they turn a tile sideways to alert them that one of their tiles is out then also what they might do 
let's turn it again if another tile goes out. So if the tile is one way, like let's say it's um, the top is pointing to the left, one tile is out. If the tile is pointing to the right, two tiles are out. So every time they fuss with that tile, especially right after someone discards, I know that's the tile that they need. And if they keep doing that, you might be able to determine if they're playing evens, let's say all those discards are even tiles. Well, you're playing an even hand. So right. if you're observant by watching the, the different tells, not just the tile tells, but the hesitations, the flinches, the cringes, the verbal tells, you can kind of figure out uh, what at least their ca what category they're in and sometimes maybe even what hand they're playing depending also on their exposures and what is out on the table so all that information you can pull together by observing interpreting and then figure out how you want to use that information and then make a decision on how to go forward well zoom zoom and has really these tells can help yeah. your own hand yeah. Well, Zoom has really showed me that I, I mean, I've always known I'm from New York originally. I'm a hand talker or whatever, but Zoom has really taught me about how I speak. And it's amazing. Like, I don't even want to listen to the talks after to hear, but what um, I did notice, and this I knew, knew before even COVID is when I was ready to call Mahjan, my posture got really good and I would sit closer to the table. So now I know like, okay, my friends must figure that out too. So now I just either try to have good posture the whole time, which I don't, yep. or I just don't let myself lean forward. Mm -hmm. um, some other questions. Um, somebody asked the difference between Maj and American Mahjan. Uh, about, uh, you mean like so, Wright Patterson and American? And, and I, th I think what, I think what they meant is, um, I, I think, and, and uh, Aly Alyssa can correct me if I'm wrong. National Mahjan League is one form of Mahjan that is considered nicknamed American Mahjan. There's also other styles that are American Mahjan. Most of the time, if you hear someone say American, they're talking about National Mahjan League play with the card. Yeah. Typically, there's also yes. Wright Patterson, which was developed on Air Force bases. So there's over 40 styles of Mahjan played throughout the world. And we actually did a trivia night about the different styles. Yeah. Um, yes. We had a great, a great point. Um, you were saying about complaining about jokers. Eileen said there's plenty of people who complain that if they're quiet, you know, they do have the jokers. So that's a big tell. Um, somebody asked, and this I actually know the answer to, um, on the big hand, it was moved. It is still singles and pairs. The 85 cents still counts for the difficulty of it. So you do double if you self pick it. You do not double if it's jokerless because it has to be jokerless. So that we got confirmation mm -hmm. from the league. Um, yes. Sam asked, what is the hardest aspect that you believe of National Mahjong League Mahjong? I think for American Mahjong, it's not, it, it's training yourself to be flexible and play at the category level as long as possible. So it depends really too on how you're taught how to play the game. Some people are taught to pick a hand right away. And I think that is the hardest way to play this game. If you can train yourself to play at the category level, meaning this kind of goes into something we're gonna talk about, I think in a little bit, but uh, if you play at the category level and build around the strength of your hand and stay flexible by, um, not picking a hand early. You just gather for the category rather than picking a hand right from the beginning. The staying flexible category level is I think one of the best ways to play this game. So in, a, in the future, we plan on having an etiquette talk. Um, one of our Zooms is gonna be on etiquette. I don't believe it's poor etiquette. I actually think it's strategic. If you're passing tiles, and you see that the person next to you just goes like this and makes a face and passes them along, you know they don't need your even tiles that you're playing an odd hand. I do believe, and this is just my, my humble opinion, I do believe that it's somewhat cheating and unfair if you try to watch someone's eyes when they're looking at the tile. To me, that's just not polite. Oh, looking so, like looking at, like where are they looking at the card? Yes. And we had two people comment that looking at a, one side of the card is a tell and how do you keep... So what a friend of mine does, which I think is actually very smart, is before she looks at her top card, she folds it in a certain way. You don't know which way she's folding it. And then she puts it on her lap. So when she's looking down, you're not quite sure which section she's looking at. So mm -hmm. I actually think that's a good way to keep people from looking. 
Um, we had Connie ask, yes. how do you and how do you, how do you recommend passing tiles in the Charleston when you have either odd or even tiles and you need one or the other for your hand? Okay, so for passing defensively, the the first thing that I recommend is your priority should always be build your hand first. That's the number one priority is focus on your hand and then look at the tiles that you have that you don't need and pass of from those as defensively as you can. So build your hand is the number one strategy and then pass as defensively as possible with the remaining tiles. Now, if you're left with those remaining tiles with something like a pear or a flower, white dragon, or maybe even like numbers, then consider taking a tile from the, the ones that you need and pass more defensively because anything you give away is going to potentially build your opponent's hand as well. So one of in one, one way that you can make that decision is to, instead of picking, uh, let's say, a single or a pair as a tile to pass, pick a tile from a potential Pung or Kong that you could then call or use a joker for later. That might be an, another That's way great. to mitigate the, mitigate the risk in your pass. And then we could do this one more question, then we could go to the next set. Um, the one question was, is it important to memorize the card each year? No, I don't think so. I don't, I don't memorize the card. I, I think when, if you play often, it'll just happen naturally, but I don't think that it is a requirement by any means. And I, I think even if you just know the, categories well and if you're able to identify the strength of your hand and know which category would be best suited for those tiles that is the skill that's more important than memorizing the card it's and knowing yeah. what to do with the strength of your hand and which category to play and even at that point you don't even need to know what hands they are if you have discards you really don't have to pick a hand until you run out of discards so and, memorizing yeah. the card i don't think so and I, I something think that i think is level i think that's a great suggestion and something that i think is very important this year is there's seven hands from last year that are exactly the same but a lot of them that are very similar. So one thing that I am doing, I mean, I've only played in person a few times, but before you discard, just make sure you have the right number of tiles for what you're doing, because it's a very, uh, really kudos to the league, because I think that they did a really interesting card this year, especially during a pandemic that they were making it remotely. So I think that that was something that you really have to you know, the three, six, nines are different, the, you know, so it's really an important thing to do is, you know, you can change whatever you put on your rack, you can change before you discard. Once you discard, you can't add or subtract to that. So, yeah, all right. It's, really if you, great. So that's we will get to the rest, we'll get to the rest of the questions in our next break. Okay. All right. So I'll go ahead and um, let's see here if I can share my screen the right way now. Let's see. Everyone, yep. please tell me if you can see the questions. Question mark. Yes, box. I, I see okay. question mark. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. So the next one is about reading hands. And this is a skill. Oh, let's see. Did we, let's see, we went through tells. Hold on one second. Verbal tells, strategy by wall situation. Okay, three, I think um, reading hands. This is. I had, two, I think the number might be off, but that's okay. It doesn't re really matter. All these uh, tips are all top three. It, the one, two, three is a minor point. So about reading hands, this is a way where you can determine what someone is playing based on what they've exposed. Typically you want to, you can read hands by having when someone has two exposures. It's Michelle, just to just to interject right now, you have it says reading hands and then it says next slide. I don't know if you're sharing it full screen. I don't oh, know if you want to. No. This is where. Oh, my gosh. What? in the it, It's fine. I mean, oh, this is, I don't understand how why why this um, screen is. Let's see here um, now. Yep. Yeah, no, that looks better. Okay, from current slide. Yep, that looks better. Current slide. Uh, and what? For some reason, it's, show, it's 
that's perfect. Now it's the full screen. Okay. Yep. Okay, good. Oh my goodness. This, this <laughs> technology has been really challenging with this particular presentation. I'm so sorry. All oh, right, no, so no reading problem. hands. So when, when someone has two exposures, you can more times than not figure out what exposures, you can kind of narrow down what hand they might be playing. But even when someone has one exposure out, you can, by watching their behavior, their tells, how they're uh, reacting to discards and what they're discarding, what the discards are in front of them, you can try to figure out what hand they're playing, not just so that you can discard defensively, but also give yourself opportunity to switch hands if you need to. If someone's in your business, reading hands is a great way to give yourself greater flexibility through observation. So this is is another thing that comes from poker strategy, but it could be applied to Mahjong. And basically it means to determine what your opponent is attempting to do. And it's a big part of defensive play. So it, it, some people think that it, it's kind of a, a mystery and some people don't even pay attention to what people's exposures are. Uh, but it is a very practical strategy. And if you observe those exposures and discards, you can really gain some information and help with your own hand or maybe give you information so that you can switch to something that might have a little more uh, freedom, especially if those exposures are something that you were intending to use. So with reading hands, it takes a lot of practice. And this is why I think playing online is so important. You can practice reading hands by playing online and observing exposures and discards and then apply what you learn in the in-person games. So this, this can be done in two it, sort of two levels. The first is hand level. A player can gain information at this level uh, and Basically, this is where I was sharing about two or more exposures and then use a process of elimination based on discards to figure out what they're playing. And then, of course, you have the discards. Whenever the discards are moved around, though, when the walls are pushed out, that can be a problem. So really, you want to try to read their hand before those tiles are moved gain that information, and then kind of start fresh with those discards after they've been moved to kind of get your footing back again to figure out what they might be playing based on their discards. Thankfully, with American Mahjong, we have random discards. And in Richie Mahjong, they have a discard pile where everyone has their own set space to discard. And you can totally tell what they don't need, and therefore you're able to determine what they're keeping. In American Mahjong, it's a little more difficult, but you can do it, especially if those discards stay fairly un unmoved. So you might be able to leverage that information. Uh, now, one, this is where bluffing comes in. Um, Dara brought that up. And some people can discard a natural tile, let's say from their hand, and maybe they have a joker in place. So try to just, reading hands is not sort of a written in stone concept. You have to be able to interpret what is be going on as opposed to just making a, an assumption and having full confidence in that interpretation. So you have to know the players and then interpret correctly and then make the best decision you can on especially how it might affect your hand. So that is reading hands. Uh, and I think, uh, let's see, if you're one thing about reading hands is it takes a lot of sort of uh, fancy footwork work and you're going to be focused on your hand and to be able to read hands, you're going to get a little distracted. So don't do this if you're a beginner. I think this is more intermediate and advanced. So try not to feel overwhelmed that you need to start reading hands as a beginner. This is more an advanced strategy. So with the begin game, this would be during the Charleston, you want to be mindful of what tiles 
are being passed to you, not necessarily what you're passing. So when you're passing tiles, you want to pass as defensively as possible, but try to remember if you can what you're being passed so that you can try to figure out maybe what your opponent is keeping, especially on that second Charleston, because you're going to be passing to the same players again. That can be a little bit overwhelming. And to kind of start, what I recommend is try to start with remembering what what the that uh, first and second left is because you're going to get two sets of passes from the player on your right. And it, it's interesting to see two passes in a row, what they're giving you. You might be able to determine what they're keeping. So also another thing that you can do is identify who passes blind at the first left, who stops the Charleston, and who passes blind on the last right. All of these things are great information to figure out more so the progression of their hand. So just this requires a lot of observation. Uh, and then also who passes less than less than three in the optional cross. So that's kind of reading hands and the progression of someone's hand during the Charleston. So when you're playing in the middle game, this is where you for example, if, if people set up, this goes along the, the lines of the tile tells. If you see people constantly putting their discards on the right side of their rack, then you'll see them pull discards from the right side of their rack. Try to change it up on your side so that when people are observing you, they're not seeing you pull discards from the right side of your rack. Eventually, they're going to be picking tiles from in, in the middle of their hand, and that's when you can determine that they're probably getting closer to completing their hand because they were taking discards from on the right that are basically unneeded. And if there's all of a sudden picking discards from the middle of their hand, they're whittling down. So they may be getting close to a win. Uh, let's see. So this part is about uh, remembering that every discard holds meaning. When someone discards a tile, it may be a tile that they just don't need, but it could also be a tactic. So if I, for example, am switching to defense and I know that I have fresh tiles, I may want to keep those tiles and start breaking up my hand. So I, even though I needed that tile, I may be mitigating risk or switching to defense. And it could be a bluff as well. And that speaks to that one example where if you have a, a bunch of joke or some jokers in your hand and you have a Kong that those jokers are helping you get, you can maybe discard a natural tile and still use your jokers to cover that Kong. And that would be considered a, a bluff. So even though someone discards that tile, that may or may not be exactly what you think it is. So we're going to stop here again and see if anyone has any questions and then we'll get to that final piece. Terrific. So um, I answered, but just to go over, someone asked what blind passing is, and that's at the end of the, the first left and the last right, right. the end of the, the two Charlestons, you can take up to three tiles that the other person passed to you without looking, that's why it's called blind, and pass them along to the next person. Um, and then let me go back to the other questions. Um, the first question we had was, how important is it to have a backup plan? Oh, it's, I, it, it's kind of situational, really, because if you have a hand and you have, let's say, at the end of the Charleston, you have five discards or maybe six discards, that's when I would probably create a plan B. But if you have four discards or less at, at the end of the Charleston, you may not need a plan B. I think it's always good to be mindful of what you could play other than a, one particular hand at any point in the game until you're at that point of commitment. But I don't think that it's always a necessary thing, especially if you've trained yourself to play at the category level. So while I'm playing, when I look at my dealt hand, for example, well, actually, we're, we're going to go into this, actually, okay. in the next segment. So Perfect. maybe then, then hold, yep, hold off. Um, <laughs> and then, then the next question. 
do you have, I know you said you, sh- you mix it up a little bit if you play with the same people all the time. Yes. But do you have a set way of setting up your dealt tile? Do you do it by suit or numerically? Yes. So when I, when I do my videos, I do it the same all the time for, t- because I'm teaching. But when I play in person, I mix it up. I put jokers, flowers, winds, dragons from left to right. And then maybe later halfway through the session, I'll swap it and go um, number tiles and then like winds, dragons and flowers in my jokers, just so that the people I play with aren't used to seeing where I'm putting my tiles. You just want to try to keep your opponents on their toes by not being able to nail down where you're storing tiles, especially jokers and flowers. And then there's a few others. Um, Barbara, um, how can you tell what other players have by knowing what they discard? So th- this is when you would observe the exposures on their rack and the discards in front of them. This would be before tiles are moved, let's say. So if they have, let's say they have threes exposed and they have very few sixes and nines and they've got ones fives and sevens you can assume that they're playing a three six nine category hand or let's say they have threes and they have sixes and nines but they have no ones twos and fours you can think see that because there are no one through four in front of them they're playing a consecutive run hand potentially got it so and then the challenge though is that Go ahead. No, this was just an interesting point from Heath. Um, They said that when they pull a tile, they don't put it where it fits. They just put it in their rack and then later. So that's a great, I have a habit and I'm trying to stop myself from doing it. When I see a tile that I need, I smile and put it where it fits. Now I just pick it, put it on the end and then discard (laughs) something else. We all know it's a keeper. She just got a keeper. keeper. (laughs) Yeah, and if, if you're putting that pick every time where it goes, then it's, you're thinking, oh, keeper, keeper, keeper. She keeps getting keepers. But if you train yourself to put that pick on the left, on the right side of your rack every time and then discard and then after someone else goes, then move it where it needs to go, you might right. be able to hide the fact that you just got a keeper. Yep. And then Sam, I'm not sure if you want to unmute yourself to ask this question. He said, do you wait for other players to declare what they're passing before taking a blind to prevent advantages? I'm not sure. You, do you mean by the number of tiles? Uh, so like, um, like, you know, when everyone declares like on the computer, everyone declares like one, two or three. Do you wait for other people to declare that? Before oh, in the, in the courtesy. Oh, you mean. Right. oh OK. Oh, so- no, no, no. In like the normal passing, like if, you know, I, first left or last right you could prevent another player you know i there is some strategy i've seen where people can do like two one you know that kind of stuff but it's really kind of you know really deep question but (laughs) um i i typically am mindful of when people are passing blind in the in the uh, first left and last right and then i'm mindful also of when people are passing less than three when they go across because that speaks to one of two things really one that they could be nearing a completion of a hand or at least narrowing down to a category and so they have few discards or that they're in between hands some people are have a tendency to straddle the fence and if that's the case, then you've got time and you don't need to worry. But if it's because they have few discards, that's when you want to think about expediting your own hand, which would mean, for example, calling discards to make exposures earlier than normal, because you want to expedite the building of your own hand before they can complete theirs. Got it. Um, so let's see. Um... Somebody wanted to know, do you put the joker in your hand where you anticipate using it so they're not all on the left or on the right side of the rack? I I think this is a personal preference for me. I prefer to keep them to the sides 
one one side or the other and I change it up. But I, I personally do not use a joker to earmark or to, I, I don't dedicate a joker to where it could be used because it could change in the next pick. And then here I am fiddling with my tiles. Anytime you're arranging your tiles or touching your tiles, you're giving away potential information. So I try to touch my tiles as little as possible. When you say no switching, like it's George. For what? Okay. Um. Uh oh, <laughs> not sure what happened there. No, I think she's muted. Oh, okay. So you just want to try not to fuss with your tiles too much because all that rearranging uh, can give away information. There, that could be there could be some bluffing going on there too. So you just have have to really know who you're playing with uh, to figure out when they're bluffing and when they're actually making decisions about their hand. Um, so. For example, like in the middle game, if your tiles are going down, you might need to switch your hand. Of course, you're going to rearrange your tiles a little bit. But by doing that, you're giving away information. Someone could maybe think, oh, she's really switching her hand because her tiles are going down. So the idea is to try to keep people from watching what you're doing. Maybe wait to reorganize your hand until it's someone else's turn to try to keep that observation from happening on your own hand. But um, try not to touch your tiles too, too much. Because it's a follow-up question. I think I misread the question before. Um, it was about how do you know what people are doing? They were referring to actually the Charleston itself. How can you tell from the Charleston what people are, what hands people are looking at? This is very challenging because for myself, especially, I don't have a very good short term memory. It's something that I have been working on, but I created a series of videos on how to read hands during the Charleston and gave some examples of how you can do that three different ways. And we won't have time to go through it, of course, now, but there are ways that you can figure out what someone might be playing or not playing. If you see a lot of evens going around, well, then you can assume that people are playing either odds or maybe three, six, nine, because six, nine is two big numbers in the three, six, nine category. Or if you see a bunch of odds going around, then you might think, well, people are playing two, four, six, eight, or maybe a year hand. So you just want to be mindful of the tiles that keep coming around to try to figure out what's being held. It's kind of like negative space. And then um, Linda was asking, how do you choose a category? And I know we don't like the term bad tiles, but if you don't have any pairs, you don't have any runs, you don't have the same number, you don't have even yeah. odd, you basically have a mush of nothing that goes with anything else. Okay, very good. Yes, this is a great question. And it actually is part of the, the next segment, which I'm afraid oh. we're not going to have time to do. It's two it minutes to eight. Huh? If you have, if you have time, I mean, we can go I over. Do? Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, no. good. I, I absolutely am happy to give as much time no, we, as we We, need. we paid for extra because we know that a lot of times that an hour awesome. just doesn't. Okay, good. <laughs> this actually goes into the next segment. So can we Terrific. go ahead and just move into it and I'll that'll answer your question. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so let me see if I can do this right. This yeah, right. hopefully <laughs> we'll okay. give you a thumbs up. Okay, let's see. I think it's this one. Cross your fingers. Okay, okay, you see style and optimization. I see style and optimization. Okay, and then and, uh, and now I see two slides. I don't now. I perfect. Now I have the whole, okay. whole page. Okay, excellent. All right. So let's see here. I'm gonna put that up there. Okay. So style and optimization. The first. Let's talk quickly about style. Style defines a player's personality and general tendencies. So for example, you know, the tentativeness of somebody or somebody who needs a lot of time to make decisions, or maybe they pick a hand right at the beginning, rather than staying flexible at the category level. These are some examples of style of play. Personality is the combination of characteristics or qualities that form the individual's character. So so you have some players that get real antsy about their hand, especially if it's not coming together or maybe their tiles are going down. You maybe will see frustration. So you can really 
see the behavior of people and their style of play and how it affects their decision making. You may have people who are very quiet or people who are very talkative. And then, of course, you have people who are competitive. These are all about styles of play. Tendencies are more about the inclination of a player as they're playing. Some people are aggressive, for example, playing favorites, playing big hands, or maybe they switch to defense very early in the game, like in the end of the middle wall, let's say. So when you think about style, consider all these things and you can use that information again to help you when you play with the same people, especially how to gain information and give yourself an advantage at the table by observing these things. And then also assess yourself. You know, am I a quiet player? Do I talk too much? Do I give off too many tells? Uh, am I playing favorites as opposed to spreading my, my vision through the whole card? Consider your own style of play. Not just about what people are doing at the table, but what are you doing and what kind of information are you getting off and where can you make an improvement by maybe pulling back a little bit so as not to give away information about yourself and your, your gameplay. So here are some things that you can use uh, for strategy, your style, and that kind of speaks to what I was just sharing. Observe your opponents for theirs. Use the information to modify your own tactics. And when I play, some people might think I'm a grumpy player. I don't know. Maybe I'll have to ask my friends. But when I play, I very, I, I'm very quiet. I don't talk very much during the game. I'll talk during the mixing, but during the game, I say very little. So I'm, I'm almost stoic because I don't want to give off any information. I don't, I, I try not to grumble or moan or anything like that. I tend to do it more so when I play Siamese Mahjong. I, I have noticed. Um, when I play Siamese Mahjong, I tend to be much more animated. I got to work on that. So just try to be mindful of your own style and your own tendencies and then see where you can pull back or maybe be a little more reserved so that you don't give off information. So this we're going to talk really quick about the different types of styles. One is what I call fixed. And this is where someone picks their hand right from the beginning. And I, I think this is the hardest way to play the game. So I, if I see somebody doing that in a teaching situation, I will encourage them to play at the category level, which we're going to talk about. So there's a fixed style of play. That's where you pick a hand from the onset. Then you have an adaptive style of play. And this is where someone will identify the strength of their hand and they'll pick a category that uses their tiles to support the strength of their hand. And then they'll gather for the category. That's called an adaptive style of play. And you, you're very flexible with that style of play because you're not picking a hand. You're not painting yourself into a corner by focusing on one hand. You're staying at the category level, meaning you're gathering tiles for the category that can be used for the strength of your hand, which we're gonna talk about more in a minute. Then we have a hybrid, and this would be where somebody may maybe plays an adaptive style at the beginning of the Charleston, and then at the end of the Charleston, they pick a hand and just focus. And really there's no wrong answer here. It's about style and what's comfortable for you. But there is good, better, and best. For American Mahjong, playing an adaptive style, category level, not picking a hand till you run out of discards or till you're forced. And when someone finally discards tiles that you need to claim for an exposure, this is the best way to play American Mahjong, category level gather tiles for the strength of your hand. When you run out of discards, drill down to free up more discards until you have to then pick a hand. But don't pick a hand until you get rid of all those discards. You really don't need to. You can stay flexible and gather. So we're gonna look at some examples and talk about optimization. American Mahjong is a game of multiples. Multiples are pairs, pungs, kongs, and then if you have jokers, of course, you can take it up to a quint. So for American Mahjong, 
we have hands on the card that the league produces for us on every given year. This is a bunch of um, percentages from an analysis that I did on the 2022 card. We're not going to go into it deeply, but the point here is that big multiples, which are punks, conks, quints, 86% of the hands on the card use big multiples. So if you build around multiples, you're going to optimize your potential to escalate the building of your hand. Look for multiples, then pick a category that uses the multiples with as many remaining tiles as possible. And so if, if you have, let's see, I think we have an if in here. If you don't have multiples, pick a category that uses the predominant pattern. So when you first get your dealt hand, you have no multiples, no pairs, no puns. You're going to then look for a category, the tiles in your hand that use the category on the card. So let's say you have mostly evens, go for evens. But when the Charleston progresses and you form a multiple, reassess your hand completely building around the multiple because 86% of the hands on the card you use them. So you will optimize your potential to exponentially build your hand if you build around multiples. So here's some examples. And um, so we're just going to look at these examples to see about, talk about efficiency really from when you get your dealt hand. So here we have an example of multiples. We have a flower, a white dragon, northwest, south. Then we have a pair of threes and cracks and a four. We have a five dot, six dot pair and a seven dot. And we have a six bam and a nine bam. So here the multiples are threes and sixes. So for this hand, you could go for three, six, nine, let's say you would be building around both multiples. So instead of being focused on, on three, four, five, six, which you could do, you could do three, four, five, six consecutive run, or you could do three, six, nine. So in this example, you might discard seven dot, maybe north. And in this case, I might even discard that white dragon. I don't typically pass a white dragon, but that would be an example of optimizing these tiles. You could play three, four, five, six, or three, six, nine by letting go of the seven dot, one of the wins, and even the white dragon if you feel you're up for that risk. So here's another example. Oh, we I just spoke to that consecutive run, three, four, five, six. And then you could even do five, six, seven, and the white dragon flower, let's say, but you would be breaking up a pair of threes. I would much rather utilize both multiples. So that's an example of multiples. And then here's the example of the three, six, nine that I spoke to early on. So here you could maybe discard the seven dot and then even two wins maybe, but that would be quite risky because of the wins on, on the card. Anytime you have uh, singles and pairs of news, it's very risky to pass two wins. So you would want to assess the risk, count the cost, and then hold your breath. Here's an example of like numbers that you could even play. Uh, north. Now, this, this was for last year's card, or you could maybe think about the third, or I'm sorry, the fourth hand down under Winds and Dragons for news with like numbers. This, again, you would be breaking up the threes. I would much rather utilize the threes and play either three, four, five, six, or three, six, nine. Even though there's some like number potential in there, utilizing both multiples is a much stronger or, or much more efficient use of these tiles. So that concludes that section of it. Do we have any questions about okay. optimization? So some of the questions- and If I may, before, before we get to okay. questions, oh. Um, so if you, so if you don't have multiples, you just have a mishmash, kind of what somebody was saying, you're going to look for the predominant pattern. If you have more odds than evens play odds, go through the Charleston. When you have a multiple reassess and build around the multiple. Gotcha. That's the concept so, there. So if anybody's friends with someone that got kicked off, I don't know why, for some reason, zoom is just being a little glitchy. I just put in the chat, um, a link that you could send to them that shouldn't require a password. They should just be able to join. So for some reason, a bunch of people have been messaging me that they were uh, kicked off. Um, some of the questions we got and later um, at the end, 
Um, we will put it on YouTube. Somebody wanted to see the percentages. So that'll be on the YouTube video when we share it. Um, I can also give you an infographic with all that on there. Oh, terrific. That'd be great. Yeah, we could add that. Somebody asked, uh, Lily wanted to know, what is an early fold? An early fold would be someone switching to defense in the middle of the middle game. Gotcha. Um, and I know and some then, people who will much would much rather force a wall game than discard the winning tile. So if they know they have a fresh tile and somebody needs it because they have two exposures and they know what hand they're playing, they may switch to defense or fold early and start discarding tiles from their hand. Well, so what's interesting in hopes well, of uh, having a wall game. A lot of people have been saying, how do I know what to expose? I get nervous if what I expose is giving away too much. And what I find on this hand, and we just did a post on it in Facebook Mahjong community. Um, I'm just making sure I have the right exposure before I post it. Um, this hand of two pungs of flowers and a kong of twos could actually be, um, I don't know if anybody wants to guess if they haven't seen our post, um, how many different tiles that your competitor could have to get Mahjong, they could actually have eight different tiles. So in a home game, that might be, you know, you'd have to pay double and that's not that big of a deal. But in a tournament, a lot of people are gonna, a lot of people are going to start uh, the, the term that the Mahjong League uses is dogging, which is when you start throwing your own hands to not give someone Mahjong. Because in a wall, in a tournament, it doesn't matter. Um, you're not paying double you are losing based on how many exposures there are. So if you're throwing to three exposures, yeah, that's negative a, points. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times people are going to start playing defensively, which leads to the next question, which is how do you know when people are starting to switch to play defensively? Typically you'll see them shuffle their tiles and put their discards to the right. That's kind of a, a standard practice. I've seen, I've seen a lot of players also, when, when people switch to defense and start breaking up their hand, you'll see a lot of tells, physical tells. You'll see their demeanor change. They'll have, you know, a frowny face or they'll, you know, moan or maybe they'll do some kind of a chin in, a chin in their hand for boredom. There are physical tells that actually happen when people switch to defense in addition to shuffling their tiles and then maybe aggressively discarding because they've had to break up their hand. So somebody had a question going back to your three, four, five, six, verse three, six, nine, choosing between the two. Um, yes. In her expression, it would matter that there was only one nine and a Kong's needed. Wouldn't the three, four, five, six be a better choice there since there's no jokers to use with the nine? Not necessarily because there are eight jokers and the chances of you getting jokers either through the wall or through joker exchanges with, you know, natural tiles. Um, you can be pretty sure that you'll come up with a couple of jokers if needed. But I think in that particular scenario, three, four, five, six probably would be the stronger, you, uh, the most efficient use of those tiles more so because of the flexibility with consecutive run. You're working with nine tiles. The flexibility alone in consecutive run is much more um, uh, 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 another way to leverage that efficiency. With 369, it's specific tiles, and it is not a very flexible category. So I agree that 3456 would be probably the most efficient use of the tiles. And then not necessarily what, because you don't have jokers. I, go right. ahead. Yes. At what at what point do you decide that you're going to start switching to defense? If I it, it it's depending on several things. The first thing I do is I'm mindful of the tiles I need, and if those tiles happen to be pairs or singles, and they're dwindling, and I need those tiles as my pair or single, I may switch to defense especially if I count my number of discards and have fewer tiles to pick in the wall based on my number of discards. So let's say I have four discards and there's only three picks left. I switch to defense. There's no way I would have to pick every single pick from the wall would have to be a keeper. And the odds of that happening are slim to none. So I keep an eye on the number of my discards, the number of picks left in the wall, my tiles that are out in exposures or discards, to determine my potential to win. 
And that's when I decide to switch to defense. And then in addition, and if I pick a risky tile, a tile that I know someone needs for Mahjong, let's say, and, and those other variables have been assessed, if my potential is low, then I will switch to defense and break up my hand and discard safely and start yeah. hoarding those risky tiles. No, very true. And then um, this is a very, this is actually towards etiquette. And I actually have a huge pet peeve with what Linda brought up. She said she's been in situations, let's say you're playing a concealed hand or pairs and attentive players notice that you're skipping, exchanging jokers or throwing out a joker. And they'll say, oh, look, she hasn't picked up any tiles or, oh, she's jump dumping jokers. She's probably close. She mm -hmm. finds this very rude and disruptive. And there's no nice way to say someone that they're being... It's frustrating and it ruins the game for her. If you're at a competitive Mahjong event and someone does that, are they disqualified? Uh, no, but if if that behavior recurs, I would probably have a word with the director in a in a tournament because that is bad form. That is a really poor poor etiquette, poor sportsmanship, and yeah. this I don't typically see that kind of behavior in a competitive setting. People know. I think people know how to behave, but there are some people who go on tilt, which is another poker term <laughs> where they get upset and they take it out on other players at the table or take it out on the tiles and it can make for a very uncomfortable game. So if you want to be invited back or if you want to be the player, basically be the player you want to play with and, yeah, and that hopefully will solve a lot of problems. And just, just as an aside, which I know this wasn't part of your question, but betters and a player that's called dead, both must remain silent. Yes. That's at a home game. Um, well, I guess at a tournament, you wouldn't have a better. But if you're called dead, you cannot say, oh, look, she needs that tile. If you're the mm -hmm. better, you can't say, you, and you can't, even if they, even if a winner had an improper Mahjong or somebody was it, you can't say anything. No. So, and, and incidentally, if a better does that, they lose their bet. Yes. That's, and a, in that's a, a league rule. And in most tournaments, I know all tournament rules vary. In most tournaments, they get minus 10 if they comment. Yeah. Yeah. So you let's see. I'm quiet. just scrolling. I am scrolling mm -hmm. through to see if I missed any um, questions. Let's see. Um, okay. So there's a teacher that started teaching beginners. She encourages them to choose a category during the Charleston and then a hand and stick with it while they're first learning. Is that a good process that you think is good for beginners? I think it depends on the player because, and it's interesting that that example was brought up because I typically would not teach that as a default. I teach to play at the category level and don't pick a hand till you run out of discards. However, if somebody is so overwhelmed by playing uh, learning the game they may need a, a solution that minimizes that anxiety to keep them in the game and that's the only time i would recommend it and i have in the past done that yeah but it's only to keep them in the game if people get so overwhelmed and and uh, frustrated with the game that they're just going to leave to get, keep them in the game by giving them a solution like that is okay, but with a with a caveat, and that is to encourage them not to stick with that as the way they play. Right. They should get back to playing yep. a hand until you run out of discards. That is the best way to play American Mahjong. Um, somebody asked if you're allowed to mark your card, example, the number of hands you make or put a dot. I don't know of any rules that say you can't. Uh, maybe in a tournament, you would not want to bring that marked card because that gives away a lot of tells of the hands you gravitate towards and the hands you mm -hmm. haven't won yet. Yeah. Um, Barbara asked, what does it mean to run out of discards? Okay, so um, if, if when you're during the Charleston, when you're, you've identified the strength of your hand and let's say you're playing uh, tiles one through six, you're, you're gathering tiles, let's say one through five, because really in, in consecutive run, five is the 
longest run. So you're gathering tiles one through five in consecutive run. You've got maybe uh, some big numbers, nines, maybe a west or a, a dragon that you might not need. So those are discards. Let's say you pass those and you your tiles one through five. Now you have all tiles in your hand one through five. You now have no discards because you've gathered for the category tiles one through five. That's when you whittle down to free up more discards. And that's when you would look at where are your multiples? Where's the strength of the hand within that one through five to whittle out more discards so you can continue in the Charleston. If you're during the pick and discard phase of the game, and let's say that you have uh, all odds, and then maybe you have a, a um, you're between big odds, and then you have three, and then one, and maybe a wind or dragon, those would be your disc. You run gathering all big odds. Once you get to all big odds and you have no more discards, that's when you whittle down and pick a hand or free up discards so that you can finally get to the point where you pick a hand. So the idea is to not pick a hand until you have to. But one of the things that could drive you to having to pick a hand early, even if you have discards, is if your tile is discarded that you could potentially take. And that's where you want to look and see, okay, how can I, will, if I claim this discard, will I be able to use that exposure in a couple different ways? Um, so maybe a Kong is used in two hands within odds then that would be a good decision to go ahead and call that tile for an exposure because you can still then wiggle between two hands until you continue to gather and get rid of those discards. And then we had another question. If you happen to get three one dots in the deal and then the rest of your tiles are all very high, do you sacrifice the pung of three one dots since the rest of your tiles don't go with it? Okay, you broke up for a moment. So, let's, oh, so sure. let me see if I could repeat it. So you get three, you get a pung of ones, one dots in the deal and the rest of your tiles are all big. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So what I would do, first of all, is look at those big tiles and see, will I be able to use the one dot with the big tiles? For example, on this year's card, there are uh, two or three hands that actually can use one, three, five, seven, and nine. The first hand under odds, and then the concealed hand under odds, and then there's a pair hand that you might even be able to put one down. You'd have to throw away a one dot uh, in order to end up with that pair, but there are four hands in this particular scenario that you could still utilize the one dots with big numbers. So the other thing I think about when I get I multiples, when I if I have a pung and then a pair, and I in between with the tiles that remain where the tiles can support the one and then that some tiles can support the pair i'll go with the bigger multiple the pun so what you have to think about is how many tiles can i use to support the multiple and that is typically the most efficient way to use your tiles the most of your tiles supporting the multiple if you have multiples that don't go together go with the multiple that uses most of your tiles and then break up that other multiple. Because sometimes you'll have a multiple that doesn't fit the majority of your tiles. That's when you play a category that uses most of your tiles, supporting the multiple and then picking the category that can use them. Um, and then somebody was asking, can you go over um, more, more about categories versus hand would you keep a lot of evens or a lot of odds before settling on a hand in that category? Okay, can you repeat the question? Sure. Can you talk more about playing categories versus specific hand? Would you, for example, keep a lot of evens or a lot of odds before settling on a hand in that category? Okay. So for me, it's not so much about the predominant pattern especially if I have a multiple in, in my hand, the multiple is what drives me. So if I have a multiple, I will look at the remaining tiles that I can use to support the multiple and then play a category that uses most of my tiles. So instead of picking a category on the card and making my tiles work for it, 
I do the opposite. I look at my tiles and let them tell me which category to play. So let's say, for example, I have a pair of twos. I have no white dragons. I've got some little numbers, but I also have a six, eight. Then I would look at how many tiles can I keep to support the two and let that be the driver for which category I play. If I have more evens than little numbers for consecutive run, I'll play evens in that case. Either way, I'm, I'm focused on the multiple with the most of my tiles to, to help drive that decision. Terrific. Um, I'm gonna just scroll through. Somebody else asked for the percentage graph, which you're gonna send us. Um, I think if I missed your question, if you could ask it again in the chat, because I'm just scrolling through and I think we got most of them. Exposing your tiles. Are you putting them in order? Oh, okay. So no, I, what I do is I expose, whatever exposure is out first goes on the far left. I just put it out, put it on the left. The next exposure goes next in, in line and so on. I do not put them in order per the card, but when I declare Mahjong, I rearrange them based on the hand on the card. Thank as you. The game, yeah, as the game progresses, you do not need to. And incidentally, Sometimes I'll see people go through the trouble of turning the tiles facing out. That is not necessary. Keep the tiles towards you. It's your hand. So when you put out your tiles, put them in order of exposure, not per the card necessarily, and face them towards you. You do not need to make that special effort to turn all those tiles around facing your opponent. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. Sure. Okay, now we have another, um, we have Marilyn Rothman wanted to ask a question. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask. Yep, I don't know why it keeps doing that. The person's hand is, okay. Marilyn, you okay. should be back on. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I had asked if you would just put up that graph of the percentages so I could take a screenshot of it. The, the percentages of how many multiples and how many dragons and how mm -hmm. many wins. Yep, sure. Uh, I can I can even do, uh, let's see here. Oh, no, that's the wrong. So um, let's see here. Yeah, I, I can do that. Um, I have another, let's see here. Bear with me for just one second here. Okay. Coming up. I don't know. Oh, there it goes. Okay. I mean, oh, shoot. That's the 2021. I, I will. Um, let me see if this one is the 2022. Yeah, there it is. Okay. I'm going to do it right now. I'll share my screen. Thank you. Here you go. This is a, an infographic and I, I can, I'm happy Sarah, so she can distribute this. But these, these are the statistics based on an analysis for the 2022 card. Then there's a lot more information on here about optimization, kind of like what we shared about in this presentation. But there's a percentages there for the category hands and category and then also the attributes which are more about multiples mixed suits pairs pairs or multiples of flowers and things like that thank you you're welcome and then um people were asking for your youtube i'm putting it in the chat oh, um, it is mahjong you. central um mm -hmm. and then let's see uh everybody's thanking you for your excellent presentation oh. um Okay, this is an ethics question, which is very interesting because I, John, I have this question a lot because I feel like I notice this and other people don't. If you notice an unfair advantage, such as you notice that a tile is chipped, so you recognize it, do you feel you are ethically obligated to point this out? 
you know what what I would do is I would play the play the, the if you're in a session at someone's home, let's say, and you notice something like that, I would wait for a break and speak to the owner of that set privately because it could be embarrassing. But yeah. I, I wouldn't halt the game. And then I would just be on my best behavior not to exploit that. Yeah. And then a question from Karen, are there any tips you have? So so just let me give a caveat. Michelle teaches from beginners to well-advanced, you know, advanced players. So if there's things that are over your head, this will be on replay on YouTube. You could watch this again, catch things you missed. Um, for players that are moving from beginner to more advanced, are there any tips to getting your mind around your hand so that frees you up to look at tells and discards and things like that? I think it's really about the more you play, the more comfortable you are adding additional strategies based on your comfortability. Try not to overwhelm yourself because you could make mistakes and go on tilt, and we don't want that. So try not to push yourself. Play as often as you can and try out different strategies and adopt the ones that resonate with you. But don't, don't try to learn them all and cram them all in. We, the last thing we want is for you to feel overwhelmed. Start with, like, let's say, for example, if I were to give, if I were to recommend one thing from this entire presentation, if you're not already doing it, is to train yourself to play at the category level and don't pick a hand till you run out of discards. And, define, be, and, and just so you know, because the questions of it, when, what do you define as category level, the sections on the card? Yes. Okay. Yep. So for example, if I have, uh, lots of evens, I would focus on the year, the even category and just gather tiles for evens. And when I run out of all my odds, wins and dragons, let's say, may, there are, there is a, there are uh, two dragon hands there though. So keep that in mind, but depending on which category or you decide to focus on, I would gather. And when I run out of those discards, now that I have all evens, then I look at where are my multiples and which, how can I whittle this down to free up discards while still building around the strength of my hand, which should be multiples if you have them. Right. Um, and then one question we had was, do you have any tips for those that are still only playing online? I'm sorry, can you repeat? You do, you, do you have any tips for players that haven't started playing in person yet? They're only playing online. Okay, so the... It depends, I think, on where you're where you play. I only play at Mahjong time, and there is Mahjong time where there's a hesitation that you can see happening if the tile is discarded. There's a swirl that goes around the tile, and you can by discard after discard, you can kind of figure out who might need that tile based on the hesitation. I don't know if other platforms have that same to show that tell, but you can try to figure out who might need that tile. And eventually based on their exposures and the tiles they're hesitating on, you can figure out what they're playing. But with playing online, I think just playing often and it can help with your decision-making, especially if you're still learning the new card and getting comfortable with the unique shapes on the card, because there are a lot of unique shapes on the card. Playing online is one way to really learn the card, the hands on the card. Yes, definitely. Um, so with that, um, let's see, let's wrap up. Um, I saw three, four, five, so oh, using pairs. Oh, so Nancy was saying that she also saw in that example you gave with the three, four, five, six, the north, south with the consecutive run. So what oh, yeah, would you three, yeah. yeah. So what would yeah. I'm sorry. What would you what would you have discarded in that hand? I would have given up the win. Okay. Because the wins were all singles and number tiles are much more efficient. So you'll have much, much more flexibility with number tiles. If if there were multiples with the wins, especially either north, south, or east, west, then I might have reconsidered. But because they were all singles. I would go with number tiles. Got it. And then um, 
I'm going to thank you very much for this. And I know we went way over and I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, I am going to, let's see, let me share my screen. Uh, so for all of you who are asking for um, screenshots of what Michelle shared, she's going to send them to us and we will put them on our Facebook group and our YouTube. Can, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So please check out our YouTube channel. If you subscribe, as soon as it's uploaded, there's, I think there's a button that you could click for notifications. Um, our tournament is currently going on. We love combining Mahjong and Itzvah. You could play in law, on person, well, on person. You could play in person or online. You could pick the time and day. You could register as an individual or a foursome. You could play on Michelle's favorite Mahjong time. You could play on real Mahjong whichever site you want or in person, we send you a custom score sheet and you could win prizes and a percentage of proceeds goes to the Alzheimer's Association. And also while we have you all here, thank you very much for all of you who purchased pre-orders of your Mahjong League card. We sold over 8,000 cards and raised wow. a minimum raised a minimum of $20,000 for Alzheimer's. So that was, wow. we really appreciate That's that. Wonderful. Thank you. And then our next Zoom, and hopefully we will work on the mute option and we will figure out what's going on with Zoom. But our next Zoom is May 17th with Karen Goen, otherwise known as Bubby Fisher. And she is going to be going over the 2022 card, her tips and tricks. Um, we thank you all for, um, we do this on our own time and own dime, just like all of the wonderful guests that we have are generous to share their expertise. So if you have the time, and are looking for a gift for yourself or friends, we invite you to check out our website. Um, our next thing is um, we are expanding. People said we love Maja. We also love Canasta. So we are expanding. Oh, we we just awesome. introduced to the Canasta Meldminder. So for those of you who play Canasta, it's a great way to remember that spins, to remember what your team's meld is. And um, this is one thing we invite you. We want to see pictures of happy Mahjong players. So, or frustrated Mahjong players or anything, just pictures of you playing Mahjong. So if there's an interesting game that you have, if you have a beautiful tablescape, um, somebody made a comment that they wish there was, Facebook had a jealousy button. And we're like, no, it's not jealousy. It's mudita, which is um, a word in Sanskrit that means sympathetic joy. So we oh. just thought that that was something that was a really sweet thought, Mahjong mudita. So we really appreciate everybody for, I think that's it, yeah being here tonight. And um, this is long, so it might take a little while for us to um, upload this. I think that, um, let me just make sure there's nothing important to catch up. Nope, we're getting a lot of thank yous to Michelle. And we really You're appreciate welcome. not not only this time, but also all of your videos. I mean, it's amazing. I don't know if you realize how many people, I mean, your ears must be ringing all the time with people that are learning how to play and, and <laughs> recommend you. So. Thank you all for thank joining you. us tonight. Have a great yeah. night. Thank you for inviting me. And thank of you course. all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.